Hello, and welcome to the webinar on organic pastures. This webinar will be about the effects of different organic pastures on heifer growth and development, and it will be presented by Jacob Hadfield of Utah State University Extension. I'm your host, Alice Formiga of eOrganic. For the past 10 years, eOrganic has published articles, videos, and webinars about organic farming and research, and you can find all of them on our new website at eOrganic.org and on the eOrganic YouTube channel. So today I'm very pleased to welcome Jacob Hadfield, who works for USU, Utah State University. He was a major contributor on the Defer Dairy, Defer, Dairy Heifer Organic Grazing Project as the graduate student monitor, monitoring the growth and development of dairy heifers. Jake was raised on a family beef operation in Utah. He, along with partners at Utah State University, are working on a Western SARE um, and a NIFA OREI project to improve the sustainability of organic pasture-based dairy, and they have a website which describes them at um, eorganic.info slash dairy forages. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to you, Jake. Well, perfect. Thanks, Alice, for that introduction. I really appreciate it. And I'm excited to be here to present to you guys today. Um, like she mentioned, this project's kind of a multi- um, facet project that we have going on. We have a couple different webinars talking about this project and specifically my role in the project is I did my master's work looking on how these organic pastures that we were raising these heifers on, how it affected their growth and development specifically. And so before I get started, I just wanted to give some acknowledgements here real quick. First of all, I wanted to thank my major professor, Kara Thornton, for helping me with this presentation. She's actually gonna be on here to help answer questions at the end of this um, presentation as well. And so I wanted to just kind of put her here as well as recognize many other people who are involved in this. If I could put everyone's name on it, I would, but there are quite a few people that have helped with this project. We also wanna thank Western SARE as well as you, the USDA and specifically the OREI program for funding this project to make it possible that we could be able to do this research. Now to get started in this presentation, just to kind of start with some background information. First of all, we kind of got to understand what replacement heifers are in the dairy industry. And many of you are probably already familiar with this, but I do like to kind of start on a level playing field so that we can all understand where the problem's coming from and why we're addressing this specific need. And so with replacement heifers, these are heifers that are designated to replace our lactating cows that are going to be leaving the herd. So these animals are very important because they're coming in to be the major milk producers in these operations. If we look across the U.S., one-third of the average dairy herd is replaced each year, and so there's a large number of animals that are going in and out of these herds, so it's important that we're focusing on making sure heifers are developed and are able to come in and handle the production load that they're going to be facing. Um, one of the other things that we see is that replacement heifers are the second largest expense on an operating dairy. One of the main reasons behind this is that these animals basically for two years we feed these animals without them receiving any monetary gain because until they can be able to have a calf and start lactation these animals basically do not have any monetary gain given back to the production system. And so we can see the cost can quickly um, build up as these animals are growing. And so in order to help us with these costs, we kind of got to understand what we're doing in developing these heifers. And so ideally what we're looking for is we want to try and breed these heifers at 55 to 65% of their mature body weight. Now, if we try and breed these heifers before they reach this point, a lot of times what we see is that these animals aren't quite ready to breed. They haven't reached reproductive maturity. And so basically you see that it's a waste of money trying to breed these animals at this point. We also see though, if we wait until these animals are at a bigger stage of point or, or basically at a larger mature body weight, we have increased our feed and labor costs putting in these animals and we've actually delayed their, um, delayed the time that it will take them to be able to get to productivity in the operation. Um, so ideally, what we want to be doing is having these heifers bred at 14 months so that they can calve before or by the time they're two years of age or 24 months. And so that's a critical thing because we want to make sure that these animals reach these endpoints, especially in a pasture-based system as well. And one of the things to mention, though, is that costs will decrease the quicker we can reach this mature body weight, this breeding weight that we want to hit. But one of the problems that we have with this is if we try and increase this weight too fast, 
products, we also see that that can be detrimental to future milk production. And so it's kind of a balancing act that we're doing here to try and make sure that we can decrease costs so we're not spending too much money while at the same time making sure these heifers maintain adequate lifetime milk production. And so to kind of understand how these, diff these heifers are developed, and there are multiple dairy systems that are used. And one of the main ones that is used, as I have shown up here, is using a total mixed ration or a TMR to be able to feed these heifers. The nice thing about having a TMR is that it is completely controlled. The, op the dairy producer can control the nu nutrients that are going into these animals and can look at things like, how much do I want these animals to gain? And there really are no variables because they can what they feed these animals that's what these animals eat um, the, this is used in both conventional and organic practices we do see that the cost of this can be pretty high um, but overall it does allow you to control the nutrition um, for your animals we also see that in some cases um, there are operations that will feed their dairy heifers hay and then they'll actually feed a grain on top of it and so like I said these aren't all the dairy systems that are available but these are some of the popular methods that we have. Another popular method that we see is raising dairy heifers on pasture and now pasture is a kind of a different animal just due to the fact that it has differences in the nutrition quality and different things and so there's some advantages and disadvantages that come with using pasture specifically to raise dairy heifers. Some of the advantages that we see in these pasture settings is that we see a decrease in feed costs just due to the fact that we're relying on our pastures to be able to provide that feed. Another advantage that we can see is that these um, pastures can be more simplistic. There's less labor and time involved. Now, one thing I should say with this is that with intensive grazing practices, that's not always the case. Sometimes the intensive grazing practices do take more labor and time. Um, but overall, we do see that pasture can be less intensive than some of the other feeding systems. Now, some disadvantages that we see when we're using pasture is that our pasture really is dependent upon the time of the year. Now, one of the things I'm, the background information I'm giving you, I'm trying to give you background information specifically where we're at in Utah here in the Intermountain West. So one of the things that we see is this nutrition is very dependent upon what the time of year is due to the fact that as the summer progresses, we start to see our um, plants get more maturity and we start to see um, basically the grasses start to decline in quality and different things. Um, we also see that climate can have effect, rainfall, precipitation and different things can affect what our nutrition is. Um, we also see that there's a decrease in production gains just due to the fact that there isn't the same control that we have compared to that TMR setting where we're lacking the, you know, we can't control exactly what these animals are eating and we, we, we just can't control as many variables. Last but not least, we do see that in a pasture setting, there is an increase in parasite load. We see that these animals are eat grazing where they're defecating and so there is a chance for these parasites to be able to grow exponentially if they're not monitored, monitored carefully. And so with pasture, I mean there's advantages and disadvantages and probably this next slide that I'm going to be talking about, you guys probably know most of this already, but it's important to understand what kind of requirements that these organic producers are facing in organic dairying. And so some of the requirements that we have, these are not all of the requirements that I have listed here. These are just some that relate directly to our pasture systems and some of the things that um, we basically would see when we're looking at raising heifers on, on pasture. So first of all, it's important that these animals are fed 100% organic feeds and that a minimum of 30% of a ruminant's dry matter intake must come from pasture during the grazing season. Now the grazing season is determined where you're at geographically, um, but it is important to note that these animals need to make sure that they're being accounted for that 30% of their dry matter intake has to come from grazing or from pasture. We also see that they're, the antibiotic and parasiticide use are restricted and there's specific rules on that with the organic program as well. But some interesting facts that we've seen about just the organic dairy industry in general is that organic dairy production has become the fastest growing segment of US organic agriculture. This stat is from 2012. I don't know if it's still the fastest segment, but I know that it, it carries a heavy light um, with 
it's still in organic agriculture. We also see that on average, organic dairy systems have higher costs than conventionals. And this stat that I have here is from 2016. So again, I'm gonna tell you that the milk markets have changed since 2016. And so it's important to take that note. But during this year, we saw that on average, the organic dairy producers were spending about $8.62 more per hundred weight of milk and costs than conventional counterparts. So some of you may be asking, well, you have all these restrictions and extra cross costs, so why should you do this? Well, this next slide really shows us why. And, and again, I'm, I'm just stating this. This is from 2016. We need more current numbers due to the fact that the milk market has changed so much. Um, but what we saw in 2016 is that basically organic producers were receiving $18.84 more per hundred weight of milk per hundred weight of milk than their conventional counterparts. And you can see, I put some states up here. These are some of the more organic, more organic heavy milk producing states. Um, and you can kind of see the different numbers, the income, the cost, see the difference there. And the profits is really where you can see a lot of the bottom line there. And I just wanted to show this because that really shows one, I mean, organic is, there's many different reasons to go organic, but this is one way that you can look at it and being able to provide more premiums, but also being able to help and be more sustainable as well um, in the dairy industry. And so in order to help us become more sustainable though, it's important that we look for ways that we can diminish costs and help, help increase our inputs. And so one of the things, that we can do to be able to do that is we can look at improving pastures. And so one of the first um, things to look at is obviously fertilizer. Fertilizer is kind of a simple way that we can be able to improve our pastures, provide nutrition to our plants. Now, as we're talking about an organic setting, again, there are many fertilizers are prohibited um, and there are only certain products that can be used. And so the products that can be used as fertilizer usually cost more due to the demand that they have for it. But this is one way that we can be able to improve our pastures and help overall inc increase quality and yield. Now, looking at a different way to kind of come and approach this is looking at using legumes and mixing them with grass and pastures. There's been a lot of research that has shown by using these legumes that are able to fixate nitrogen from the air and put it into the ground um, allows these pasture grasses and overall pasture quality and yield to increase, especially protein. Um, we can see that there's an increase just due to the fact that there's more yield, but there's also just a better quality from these pastures. And so that this is another way that we can improve pastures. And kind of the last way I wanted to talk about is a little bit on the new side in research, a little bit more, um, but is using specific legumes that contain condensed tannins. Now in the research, these condensed tannins have been shown to help improve rumen efficiency. There's been quite a few studies that have shown increases in production gains, such as weight gains, milk yields, wool yields. There's been a lot of different studies that have shown that. And condensed tannins have also been shown in other research to help basically eliminate bloat in a grazing setting, as well as um, being able to decrease parasite load in certain um, studies and in certain ruminant animals. And so there, these three ways are ways that we can improve our pasture. And the two ways really focus on improving the overall pasture quality, nutrition and everything. The last way actually focuses on the animal itself, the ruminant, to be able to help them be more efficient in digesting nutrients and be able to get more from their pasture overall. So for this study, we, our objective was we wanted to determine the impacts that different organic pasture forages have on dairy heifer growth and reproductive development. So in order to accomplish this objective, we needed to take certain measurements just to follow these heifers throughout. And so first of all, one of the first measurements, our physical measurement to help us measure growth is we used weight. And weight's one of kind of the key indicators. And this is just an outline. I'm gonna talk a little bit more in depth about these. Um, second, we took some blood samples and we were able to take serum metabolites. The serum metabolites we specifically looked at were blood urea and nitrogen. Um, and insulin-like growth factor one, which is also known as IGF-1. We looked at parasite load, monitoring fecal egg counts, as well as at the end of the study, we looked at reproduction to determine what kind of conception rates we had at the end of the study. And so just going in a little more detail, 
first of all, using weight. Weight was kind of one of our more basic measurements that we use. We use this to help determine heifer growth status, and many producers use this to help determine when their heifers are ready to breed. And so this is a common measurement used throughout, um, and it's a measurement that can help us be able to understand better where these heifers are on their growth curve, where they're at, and kind of what stage of maturity they are in. We also looked at blood urea and nitrogen um, from our blood samples. And one of the nice parts about blood urea and nitrogen is it can be a general indicator of our heifer protein intake. Um, we see that when we have increased protein intake levels, we also see that the amount of urea increases in the blood. Now there's been some other research that's talked about high blood urea and nitrogen levels can actually be detrimental to conception rates or to reproduction. Um, there's one study that showed that lactating cows that had high blood urea and nitrogen levels that were above 19 milligram per deciliter had a 20% decrease in pregnancy rate, which is huge. Um, from some of the other research, what we saw is that basically blood urea and nitrogen levels below 15 milligrams per deciliter were really ideal for reproductive performance, whereas blood ure urea and nitrogen levels that were above 20 milligrams per deciliter really showed some detrimental signs to conception. And so these are some things to consider, especially as pasture is considered to raise blood urea and nitrogen levels more than some other feed settings. And so these are some considerations we are thinking about and why we chose to measure blood urea and nitrogen specifically. Next, we also chose to look at insulin-like growth factor one or IGF-1. Um, and the reason we did this is because IGF-1 is strongly associated with growth. Um, it's a major influencer in growth. There's also been some other studies that have shown it can be an indicator of energy balance. Um, and due to the fact that it has some nutritional components, it's also shown to be negatively correlated with fecal egg counts. Just because as you get more parasites, those parasites tend to steal nutrition and you see the IGF-1 levels um, start to decrease with that as well. Now, last but not least, oh, no, not quite, parasite load. So talking about our fecal egg counts, um, one of the things to consider is that heavy protein loss as well as decreased rates of gain due to parasites can be very much a financial burden to livestock producers. Now, in our organic industry where we're limited in our anthelmetic, or our, we're limited in the anthelmetic use that can be used for these animals, um, they may be more susceptible to parasite infection just due to those limitations that they have. Um, there's also just basically the fecal egg counts, their eggs per gram is how it's measured, and it can just help us indicate what kind of heifer parasite load we have. And again, I can't mention how important this is for pasture animals because really if, if this isn't monitored, we can actually see quite a bit of exponential growth in these parasites and can cause a serious problem in some systems. Now, last but not least, talking about reproduction. So at the end of the study, looking at conception rates, basically if we can't get these heifers to breed, then there, we've had some issues along the way. And this is what really will cause problems in dairy sustainability is if these animals can't breed because that's what helps us get into lactation. There's been some studies that showed that pasture-based systems can negatively impact conception rates. But on the other hand, there's actually other research that shows there is no difference between conception rates between animals raised on a traditional system, such as a conventional system or a pasture-based system. And so really there needs to be more research in this area to help us determine more um, what kind of impacts pasture can have on conception rates. And so our hypothesis overall throughout the study was that we, the provision of mixed pastures, our legume and grass mixtures, will result in improved growth and reproductive efficiency in developing dairy heifers when compared to our heifers that were developed on monoculture grass pastures. So to help you understand that, we kind of need to talk about our materials and methods, go through how we carried out the study so that you can see, basically, you can see the methods that we took so that our results make more sense to you as well. And so what we did is we actually conducted this study over a three year period. It happened in 2016, 2017, and 2018. Over that three years, we used a total of 210 yearling Jersey heifers. And below you can see here where it's separated out by the amount of heifers each year. For each individual year, the tri grazing trial lasted for 105 days. And our heifers were sampled every 35 days, starting at day zero. 
So when we first got these heifers, many of these heifers came from um, a conventional setting. And so what we did is we initiated them with a two week grazing period so that we could be able to help them transition from the diets they were on into a grazing diet and to make sure they were capable of grazing well. Um, on that day zero, when we took heifers and sampled them, th this is when we randomly assigned them to a block and treatment. And so to help you visualize this block and treatment section, because it's a little confusing, I kind of created this diagram here. And what we did is actually every year we had three different blocks so that we could replicate each treatment three times. And so what we had is we had eight different pasture treatments as well as a ninth treatment, which is heifers that received a TMR. These heifers that received a TMR were here to be kind of a positive control so that we could compare our pasture treatments to what the heifers did on a, in a conventional, more of a conventional setting. And so to look a little bit closer and see what specific treatments we used, first of all, um, as you can see, we use four different pasture grasses. We use perennial ryegrass, orchard grass, metabrome, and tall fescue. Now, how the eight pasture treatments worked is four of those pasture treatments were those grasses used in a monoculture setting. So it was just the grass alone. Now our four other treatments were in a mixed setting where we mixed in an interseeded bird's foot trefoil in those pasture grasses. And so basically that gave us all eight of our treatments by mixing those grasses with bird's foot trefoil there. And again, like I mentioned, we had our ninth treatment where we had heifers um, eating a TMR just so it could be our control so we could see the differences between the two. Now to talk about how we graze these animals, I'm gonna go one step further into it and show you how in each individual pasture treatment um, was treated in a sense. And so what you can see is we actually separated each of these individual treatments into five different paddocks. Okay, and so what would happen is we used a rotational grazing scheme where these heifers were on each paddock for seven days. Now I know some of you probably are thinking seven days is not really a true intensive rotational grazing scheme, um, but it was something that we had to do in order to, just with the resources we had as well as the manpower, um, that's kind of the parameters we had to set it in. But as you can see, every seven days, what we do is these heifers would get moved into the next section, and we'd go all the way till we got into day 35. And once we reached day 35, what would happen is we'd take these heifers, round them up, and we'd actually fast them for 12 hours. And then what we do is we'd take samples from them. And so we'd take weight samples, blood samples, fecal samples, and then we'd turn the heifers back out at their starting place. So each of these paddocks got a 28 day resting period um, between grazing. And so, um, Last but not least, we did a reproduction protocol as well. And I'm not gonna go into too much depth. One thing I do need to say though, is that these heifers with this AI protocol specifically were not treated organically um, due to the fact that we wanted to be able to measure these conception rates pretty precisely. So we wanted to use a fixed time AI protocol. Um, and so we did this after the day one of five of the study. And this just kind of shows you what protocol we used in general, just so you can see. And actually we're gonna be talking in another webinar a little bit more about reproduction and we'll talk more about this at a later time. And so now let's get to talking about our experimental design. And so for my results, it's just important that you understand that we ran two different types of analysis. So you can kind of see the difference between the analysis we ran. First of all, we ran an analysis looking at pasture type. And so this is a little bit different, but what we did is we basically labeled two different types of pasture type. There's mono and mixed. So our mono is basically all of our monoculture grass pastures combined. So we didn't look individually at metabrome, orchard grass, perennial rye and tall fescue, but instead we combine those together. And what our mix is, is we use all of our mixed grass and birds foot trefoil pastures combined. So basically we used all the mixed pastures and put them all together. Now the reason for this is because we wanted to look at the effects specifically birds foot trefoil was having, and we kind of want to see what difference in effects we could see from that on that level. We also did another analysis where we looked specifically at the treatments because we wanted to look at just how treatments fared against each other. So looking at metabrome versus, you know, metabrome plus birds foot trefoil or metabrome versus orchard grass. So we could kind of see differences in between those as well. And so with that, um, we'll go into the results and kind of talk about that. And so this first figure that I have here is 
bipasture type again, where we have our mixed pastures, which have bird's foot trefoil, or the heifers who receive bird's foot trefoil, as well as monoculture pastures, which are the heifers that just receive the monoculture grass itself. Now I have p-values up here, and just kind of to give you a brief summary of these p-values, basically what they mean is it's what the chance of being able to replicate this data again um, and so what we want is if there's a 0.01 p-value, there's a 99% chance that if we did this study again, we could be able to replicate these results. And so you can see here, basically, if you have a p-value less than 0.05, a lot of times that's considered significant. Um, and so you can kind of see what kind of p-values we had. But mainly, I want to just point out in this graph, you really can see from day 35 to day 70, these heifers weight gains, that's really where they start to separate between the two different treatments or two different pasture types. And you can see that on day 70 and day 105 that that continues throughout. And I just, I think it's important to notice here that these heifer weights were higher and you can just clearly see how that starts to divide out itself. Now, if we look specifically at the treatments, this gets a little busy, so I don't want you to focus on this too much. But one thing I wanted to point out is that black line along the top, that solid black line is our TMR, our heifers that receive TMR. And so you can kind of compare how the weights compared throughout the study here. Um, just so you know, on this graph, all the dashed lines represent mixed pastures where the solid lines represent our monoculture pastures. And there's a key on the side, but you can kind of see and you can kind of see how the mixed pastures tended to um, have the increased weights um, compared to the monoculture pastures overall. Um, and to look at that in a little more detail, I actually put this table up here so that you could see the overall heifer body weight gains throughout the 105 day period, as well as the average daily gains, just so you can see the differences there. Um, and so it's interesting to notice that we see our mixed pastures again are on the higher end of our monoculture grasses, where some of them are close still. Um, orchard grass and tall fescue with bird's foot trefoil, we're really pretty close overall. One thing I did want to mention on this graph, though, is if you look at our our heifers that received a TMR, it actually shows that they um, gained less than the heifers that received perennial or I plus bird's foot trefoil. And it doesn't necessarily mean significantly less. They're pretty much similar. Um, but the one thing I wanted to state about that is we did have some issues with the feed rations in our TMR. We, were, we ran out of some of our feedstuffs. And so it created kind of an issue with weight gains. And so a lot of people have said this might be more realistic of what you'd see at a dairy. But at the same time, due to the fact that we didn't have the same type of feedstuffs consistently, it kind of created some issues. We were actually aiming to gain about 1.8 pounds per day with the ration that we had created. So that just gives you an idea of what we're looking at. I also wanted to point out, if you look down below the line here on this table, there's a line on the bottom. If you look at our mixed pastures, so that's our heifers that receive bird's foot trefoil compared to our heifers that just receive the grass pastures, you can see that heifer body weight gain has quite a difference there between just the overall weight gain as well as the average daily gain. And so just some industrial implications of this is really what we saw is that the bird's foot trefoil really did help those heifers with their body weight gains um, and overall just helped them to increase and gain and different things. We saw that our TMR, our heifers that received a TMR were very consistent, but we also saw that our heifers receiving perennial rye plus bird's foot trefoil did really well and had really um, high weight gains as well and were comparable to what we ended up seeing with our heifers who received a TMR. And so that's just some things to consider as we think about those, the different weight measurements that we had there. Now, if we're moving on talking about the blood samples that we took, first of all, here's blood urea nitrogen and it's divided by pasture type. Now, this is what we would expect to see. One thing I wanted to say before I get into this graph though, is if you look at our pasture type, I actually, that p-value isn't correct. This p-value is supposed to be less than 0.01 .01 for those of you who are looking at these p-values, but this, this figure here is a really good figure to describe what differences we'd expect to see with blood urea nitrogen. You can see the heifers that had bird's foot trefoil in their pastures clearly had a higher protein intake, and we really do see that clearly here. You can see that separation. You can see there is that significant um, at day 35, day 70, and day 105, and just it, it's just really clear throughout here. And so if we look at the different treatment as well, 
we can see that the different treatments, you see our TMR kind of sticks out there with its solid black line, but we see that our mixed pastures again tended to be up there. Our orchard grass at the end did have a pretty high blood urea nitrogen, our heifers who were grazing um, orchard grass there. But overall, you can see that it, there's that separation and everything. Now, one thing I wanted to point out before I get too far into this, um, and this is kind of the implications of blood urea nitrogen, is if you look on the left-hand side, I don't know if you remember me talking about this earlier, but they say that ideally what you want is your blood urea nitrogen concentrations to be below 15 and basically just not to get over 20. And if you look at these two figures, you see here that the blood urea nitrogen level at max was probably at 15 here. And over here, it's about probably 16, 17. So we see that our blood urea nitrogen levels were able to stay consistently low to a point that we wouldn't expect them to impact reproduction. Now, also talking about our other serum metabolite here, um, specifically IGF-1. Now, this is our indicator of growth and energy that we have, that we're looking at. And if you look at this mix, the heifers that receive bird's foot tree foil in the mixed pastures compared to the heifers receiving monoculture grass pastures, we really don't see a lot here. It's kind of hard to divvy out any differences. Um, if you look at the treatment, we one of the things I really wanted to point out is if you look at the TMR there with the solid black line, you can see it clearly is pretty consistent throughout the summer and stays up on the top range. One of the things that I also find interesting is if you notice on that last day 105, we see that the heifer IGF-1 levels really tended to increase at that last section there. And so there's some interesting things to look at here. It's a little confusing because there's a lot of just different, different things that are going on. And so, but overall, one of the things I think we can take from this if we're thinking about industrial applications is first of all, our blood urea nitrogen levels didn't affect, shouldn't have too much of an issue on our conception rates. But also looking at IGF-1, it really showed that the TMR was a very consistent source due to the fact that we can control the nutrition. And you could see there that its nutrition stayed pretty consistent or it's the heifers that received that had consistent IGF-1 levels compared to just some of the differences we saw on pasture. Now, moving into our next session, section, talking about parasite load specifically. Now, one of the things I've got to point out before I get going in this is the fact that we actually had this, our fecal accounts were run in two different counting methods. So we had to run them separately just so we could see them separately. So the first method that we used in 2017 was the Wisconsin sugar float method. Um, and as you can see here, there really wasn't much significance. They're saying this is pretty close, um, but you can see the, you know, it looks like the mixed heifers who received mixed pasture did have lower um, parasite load. But if you look at the number on the side, that's pretty small and it's hard to create any differences when the number there is so small. For that specific test, they say a moderate infestation of parasites should be about at 10. And so we're really on the very low range in the parasite on that. But this is what we'd expect to see the, in year 2017 on this graph. This is what we'd expect to see in a regular um, parasite load. Um, and you'd expect it to increase as the summer continues on. Now, when we look over at 2018, again, there's not much to see here. You can see that the egg counts, specifically the eggs per gram, you can tell there's a difference in the counting method just due to the fact of how those, those two, um, numbers compare, but you can see that we kind of have a weird shape in this graph where it really spikes up in the middle and then drops off. Um, and it's, it's kind of hard to know what caused this because I mean dewormer wasn't used and we do think there was some tech or sample errors that happened here. And so anyway, there's some things we're looking at there to just kind of determine. But overall, what we kind of came to the conclusion of is the fact that we we really didn't see a difference. One of the things we were specifically looking for is to see if birds with tree foil could impact parasite load and help decrease it, but we really didn't see that in our study. Now, one thing I wanted to point out though is the variety we used known as Party birds with tree foil um, tends to have lower condensed tannin concentrations, but also another thing to point out is that a lot of the research around this targeted specific parasites whereas ours wasn't as specific in targeting. And there, there just needs to be more research to determine what type of impact condensed tannins can have on parasite load. Now, last but not least, and I'm not gonna go in 
too much depth about this in general, um, but talking about our conception rates or the reproduction values that we looked at. And overall, what we saw is with our pasture types, um, it, it didn't really matter if heifers were receiving bird's foot tree foil or just grass pastures. They really had similar conception rates across the board. And so, I mean, there really was no difference there and it was very similar in our treatments. We didn't see any difference between heifers receiving different treatments. We didn't see those conception rates differ. And so overall, there really wasn't much difference there. And for our industry implications, I mean, a lot of people are like, well, then you didn't really find anything. But one of the things we can point out from this is, you know, really, it didn't matter the specific pasture or pasture type that we use. Um, it it, these heifers were still able to breed in a way. And so again, like I mentioned before though, we're gonna be talking about this a little bit more in depth in a later webinar. And so we'll kind of um, go into some more of this later. But overall, those are kind of the results that we saw from our study. And one of the things I wanted to point out before I talk just about the conclusions that we had is one, an important part to remember is that we are doing this specifically here in Utah in the Intermountain West, where our conditions are a little bit different. Um, we're doing this just specifically looking at, you know, the differences that could happen here. Um, you might not see these same differences due to different precipitation levels, different heat, different things like that. And so it's important to remember that we really are focusing on this area and helping the organic dairy producers here. Now, in conclusion, some things that we saw is we did see that our treatments in general had an effect on heifer body weight, weight gains, blood urea nitrogen concentrations, and IGF-1 concentrations. So basically that's just saying different treatments resulted in different numbers throughout those, those different variables. We also saw that our heifers receiving mixed pastures tended to have a higher body weight as well as have higher weight gains and blood urea and nitrogen concentrations than our heifers that receive the monoculture grass pastures. Now that's something to consider just due to the fact that those mixed pastures did tend to have the more protein um, and more nutrition value for these heifers. And again, in our study here, we didn't specifically look at the nutrition value of the pastures. That was done in the previous webinar um, that was that Blair Waldron did. Um, and so this is more just looking specifically at the animals. Um, last but not least, our pasture type and treatment had no effect on parasite load or conception rates. And so that's just some things to consider from our study that we found. And overall, I mean, this was an enjoyable experience. We worked with these Jersey heifers and it really, really was good to see just the differences that we could find here. And so with that, that wraps up my presentation, so. Okay, great. Thank you, Jake. Um, we're going to start our question and answer period. Um, did you look at parasite load in your TMR heifers, and how did that compare with the, with the parasite load in your pastured animals? Well, with that, um, we did look at we did look at it with a treatment effect, and what we what we did see is we just didn't see that it differed with our within our treatment. So overall, when we're looking at all nine different treatments, there was no difference there. Um, and so when we were looking at the TMR, we did see that there wasn't as much of a difference as we'd expect because we expect these animals would have lower um, parasite load just due to the fact that these animals aren't grazing. They're not out on pasture. Um, and so it's kind of one of those things that was a little interesting as we did find that these heifers had some parasites, but at the same time, again, there was no difference overall. And so it kind of shows us that um, in the end, there, there just wasn't that significant effect. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, let's see. I think Kara is gonna Kara add wants to chime in here. Okay, hi, Kara. All right, had to unmute myself. Okay. So I'm just gonna chime in here and add that uh, we, when we did the TMR animals also, we didn't um, give them a dewormer. And so whether or not an animal is gonna show up as having a parasite burden when they're in a feedlot is gonna depend on how clean the, the feedlot or the confined area is kept. And also things like, do they use the same, uh, is the, the bucket that they use the same for when they remove manure is when they feed. And so things like that are going to have the biggest impact on parasite load uh, when you're looking at confined feeding too. Um, so that's 
I just wanted to, to add that in. Okay, thank you, Kara. Um, anyone else? Um, it's a great time here to ask questions since we really do have some extra time. So I'm just gonna leave one more minute here in case anyone else has anything um, that they'd like to ask about this experiment or anything else related to the this project. Um, we have um, other webinars planned um, with this project, which haven't been scheduled yet, but we are going to schedule them within the next month or so. So um, we'll definitely keep you on our mailing list if you'd like to find out more about the experiments in this project. So um, if you're on our mailing list at um, eorganic.info, um, you'll receive a notification, but if you're not, you can sign up there and um, get a notice. So um, I'm just kind of waiting another minute here, but I don't see any questions coming. Um, so I'd just like to thank you, Jake, for giving a informative and interesting presentation. And um, thanks to everyone for joining us. And um, if you didn't have time to ask a question and one occurs to you, feel free to contact me and I will help you get your question answered. So thanks everyone for joining us.